Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Member Miller. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Siegel. Here. Member Purcell. Here. Uh, tonight we have the flag salute with O'Neill Middle School. And we have uh, Principal Matt Drabala. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our student council sponsors, Danielle Sines and Lisa Roach, who is the sergeant. Um, welcome. Everybody for having us. Um, I have Riley King, president, with us today, and Kate Stauffer, our vice president, and then Mary Gowale, office. <laughs> Should we stand for the pledge first? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, Grade School District 58 board members and members of the Downers Grove community. First, we want to thank you for inviting us to speak on behalf of Student Council for O'Neill Middle School. I'm Riley Kane, and I'm the president of O'Neill Middle School Student Council. This is Vice President Kate Snoffer, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One of the main purposes of Student Council at O'Neill Middle School is to provide leadership to the students, school, and community. We also help students develop a sense of responsibility and guide them to take ownership of their actions. We model these behaviors and host occasional after-school activities to celebrate the successes of our student body. Another one of our goals is to encourage students to participate in school activities and to emphasize citizenship and democracy. We strive to represent the feelings, opinions, and interests of our school community to create a strong relationship between the faculty and student body. This also includes promoting scholarship within the classroom and helping students build feelings of self-confidence and social maturity. This also helps us build a sense of responsibility for our behavior and for the choices we make. We promoted this idea a few weeks ago when we hosted a spirit week for the Red Ribbon campaign by asking our school community to provide to live a drug-free life. We also love to participate in and promote service projects within our school. This year, we held our annual Pennies for Pumpkins fundraiser, where we gave each home base a pumpkin to decorate. Each home base then had to decorate the pumpkin using the theme of television shows. Some of our favorites were Sesame Street, The Kardashians, Gary from SpongeBob, <coughs> Snoopy and His Doghouse, and the cast from Friends. Students voted for their favorite pumpkin using change and all the money raised is being used for a school beautification project. This idea will support our mission of building self-esteem and reminding everyone that they are important. Last year, Student Council recreated a You Are Beautiful campaign to support these beliefs by reminding everyone that they are beautiful and important in this community and in the world. Also for Halloween, we collected candy for the troops and partnered to send candy overseas to our deployed American soldiers. Candy cane candy grams are currently being sold during lunch for, oh sorry, to collect money and buy gifts for District 58 families in need for the holidays. For this event, our goal is to raise $500 in gift cards. To celebrate this accomplishment, we hosted an after school movie earlier today where we watched the classic movie Home Alone. Further, in the year, we would like to sell candy grams for Valentine's Day to help fund other service projects. Other events being planned for later this year include our Crosstown Dodgeball Tournament against Herrick. O'Neill, of course, will be taking home the championship that day. <laughs> <laughs> we are also planning and hosting the Flip Flop Fling in coordination with the Gardening Club in May for the entire school. We strive to be positive role models in our school and community. We hope that our efforts will help our community grow stronger. Downers Grove is a wonderful place to live, and we are honored to be part of this community. Thank you for supporting us with our mission. Thank you.
Very nice job, and we'll be sending some gifts to the school tomorrow for the students. Thank you. And then just very quickly, um, Heather Spang, our PTA president, had something come up and couldn't make it tonight, but I wanted to talk real quickly about some of the things that our PTA has been doing. Um, First of all, when you come to O'Neill, you're gonna notice some new, we have brand new benches out in front of the building, and then we also have new furniture for our courtyard. Those were um, gifts from the PTA that they used to their fundraising last year to help us out with all of those things. Um, things they've done so far this year is they uh, did a potluck dinner for us on our parent-teacher conference nights. That's something they've done for the last couple of years, and it's, it's a really welcome thing on those long days for us. Um, we just did our VIP day um, experience right before Thanksgiving. That's another PTA sponsored event where we have um, all the eighth grade students select a person important in their life, have them come in for the morning and, and it's a great activity we do at O'Neill every year and it wouldn't happen without the PTA. Um, then the big thing that they do is they do fundraisers throughout the year to offset the cost of the eighth grade boat trip and we're trying something new this year. You've probably heard of it. I know Herrick has done it for a couple of years now. Um, it's a raise craze fundraiser. And rather than selling magazines or cookies or wrapping paper or something, um, all the kids in the school think of service ideas that they can do for others and then people support them by making donations for them to do these service projects. It's something that goes really well and matches perfectly with the kind of mission and things that our student council does. So we're really excited for that coming up after winter break. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just a quick reminder that visitors in the audience will have the opportunity to speak during the reception of visitors later on the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket to my the table at my right. <clears throat> they will be used to assist us in allocating time so that all who wish to speak will have the opportunity to speak and help us follow up after the meeting. Please fill out a card if you wish to speak and there are cards there and by the doors. Um, Next, we would like to recognize, uh, have a recognition of students. Uh, we would like to formally recognize the students who participated in the 2018 PTA Reflections Art Competition and those who advanced to the regional level. It's hard to see some of those names, but uh, <coughs> they will be on the website. Uh, next is the spotlight on our schools uh, with about the Education Foundation grants with Megan Hewitt. Hey, good evening, Board of Education. Um, it is my pleasure this evening to share some information with you regarding the Education Foundation and specifically the Teacher Grant Program. Um, so first, some quick highlights about our Education Foundation. They've been supporting District 58 students for 16 years now. Um, they have a variety of fundraisers they do each year. Um, earlier this fall, they had their um, Oktoberfest in downtown Downers Grove. That was a big success. Um, we had some fantastic weather for it. Um, so they made some money there. Um, and right now, we're in peak green apple season. Um, that is an awards program where community members can make a donation to the Education Foundation and write a special message to a teacher or staff member of that who is special to them. Um, and then Superintendent Dr. Kremenskoli, um, or sometimes the principal, will hand deliver that message along with the photograph. Um, and all of their fundraisers support a variety of programs to help District 58 students um, and, and staff, including the teacher grant program. Um, so this year, um, they, the foundation awarded 18 grants worth more than $8,000 um, to support a, a variety of different educational endeavors. Um, I'll be briefly touching upon each grant, but first um, I wanted to 
formally thank all of the teachers who uh, received these grants. Um, several of them are in the audience tonight. So if you received a grant uh, this year, if you could stand up for a quick round of applause. Over the summer the, and the, at the beginning of the school year, the teachers have an opportunity to fill out a grant application. Um, so it's really, it's a voluntary effort and it does take a lot of time, but we have very committed teachers who have some fantastic ideas to improve instruction in their classroom, as you'll soon see, um, but they might not have the funding to make those ideas a reality. So this program is instrumental in facilitating that. Um, also, I wanted to point out this year, um, when we, uh, as part of the grant application, we ask the applicants to align their grant with uh, one of the district's strategic goals. So I will, the presentation will have um, dots next to each grant showing which goal, or in some cases, goals align with those grants. So uh, first, uh, three grants were awarded related to social emotional learning. The first was to Caitlin Choinsky from uh, Henry Puffer and Highland. She received some books to support um, a preschool social emotional learning library. So books that really focus on emotions and those really critical um, SEL skills that are key for um, a preschool demographic. Um, Jeanette Richelia, um, along with Emma Grissomore and Grace Clausen from Pierce Downer, they received um, some resources to support a weekly social emotional learning center time for kindergartners. Um, and then lastly, Erica Zagorski from Whittier uh, received some funding to start something called the Memory Project, which is a really cool uh, program that helps connect students to other children around the world who might be experience, experiencing some hardships such as war or the loss of a parent um, and kind of cultivates um, uh, empathy and um, also some art skills, I think. They'll be creating some sort of portrait uh, for those kids. Next, uh, the foundation awarded three grants for our English language learners. Uh, the first was to Michelle Crawley from Highland and Herrick. Um, she is starting a program that will connect um, bilingual students with some take-home um, Spanish and bilingual, I should say, bilingual books to bring home. Um, and it will encourage some parental involvement um, with the goal of really improving the parent to school connection um, as well as some literacy um, and social emotional skills. And then uh, two of our biliteracy teachers, Karina, Le Karina De Leon and Cindy Rodriguez, um, they, are, they received a grant for Number Sense, which is a math program um, that helps students uh, with math, view that math in a more visual um, and flexible manner. And then Christina Diaz, uh, another biliteracy teacher, um, is receiving some Spanish and bilingual resources that will specifically um, also address writing skills. And then each year the foundation um, tends to award books for classroom libraries. This year is no exception. Um, Ellison Brechtel and Matt Cunningham from Herrick and um, Nikki Ferroli, Addie Kostelik, Kate Nickel, and Deb Roach from O'Neill all received grants for classroom libraries. Um, if you want to see what a classroom library looks like, here are a few pictures um, from O'Neill. Uh, while there were several grants awarded, um, the grant applications all had shared a, a, several commonalities. First of all, these teachers emphasize the importance <coughs> of convenience. Um, students who have books right in front of them are far more likely to grab a book to take home to read than if they had to walk to a, the school library or the public library, um, especially for students who might not be as interested in reading. Um, it just provides an extra boost of motivation. Also, um, all of our classroom libraries are um, student selected. The books are student selected. Uh, research shows that when you give students choice in what they read, they might be more apt to read. Um, and they might get more excited about reading. They might be more likely to share with their friends what, uh, the books that they're reading. Um, so that was another commonality among all of the classroom library grants. 
Alison Brechtel is, um, oh shoot. <laughs> Um, well, Alison Brechtel is one of our grant recipients, and uh, she wasn't able to attend. Um, she created a 14-second video, <laughs> <laughs> which I place in the presentation, but... Oh. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> it's going great. Thank you, James. <laughs> But as you'll see, both um, Ellison and one of her students um, share a brief message with the Education Foundation. Here we go. Hi, District 58 Foundation. I'm sorry I can't be there this evening. But I just wanted to thank you for these amazing <coughs> Amazing box. Hi, I'm Gabe. I'm in Mrs. Greco's class, and I'm going to be enjoying all of the books that you have. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a little glimpse into um, another one of the classrooms and the classroom libraries. So as you can see, teachers are really excited, um, not only about this grant, but all of the grants. Uh, the foundation awarded three other grants that were related to English language arts um, outside of the classroom library. Um, Maureen Bresnahan, who is a speech language pathologist at LC Era, received a grant um, that provides um, some resources to help enhance uh, students' vocabulary and their general concept knowledge through um, specific weekly le language lessons that she'll be providing students in their classrooms. And then Mary Lovarski and Angela Valley, um, both librarians within our district, um, they received a grant to purchase some new books that align with specific lessons with the, within the new benchmark English language arts curriculum resources. Um, so that will have a, an immediate and direct tie in to um, our students' education. <coughs> Next, uh, we, two teachers received grants for science and math. Uh, Catherine Boyce is a first grade teacher at Pierce Downer and she received se several uh, tools to enhance um, science, technology, engineering, and math. And then Katie Herkes, who is the district's interventionist, um, she will be hosting two family math nights at El Sierra and Kingsley this spring. Family math night is, um, a few of our schools have hosted them before, uh, either with PTA funding or through other grants, um, but they provide a, an excellent opportunity to uh, bring the parents in and have a really fun interactive evening um, where students can share their math learning with their parents, get the parents involved in it, and it's just a really fun and positive way um, to pro promote community engagement and math in, the class, in the, um, our schools. Two uh, grants were awarded related to music. Rose Cloud, who is a band teacher at several schools, um, received a grant that supports jazz curriculum, um, enhanced jazz curriculum in our schools, and also has some community connections as well. And then Janet Hecht and Erin Yambau, our middle school music teachers, um, are both using a grant, are using grant funding to start something called Ikelele, Ukulele, Weekulele. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a program that will give students um, ukuleles to use in class um, with the goal of in, uh, increasing music interest and engagement. And then our last grant was, is awarded to Melissa Echtel um, and Christina Gamboa, who are both resource teachers in, at Kingsley, as well as Haley O'Reilly, who is a fourth grade teacher at Kingsley, and Michelle Schmidt who is an occupational therapist at Kingsley. And they received um, several devices called HOVRs um, that will be installed on a few desks and tables. Um, an HOVR is essentially a leg swing. So it kind of comes out of, a, out of a desk and you can put your legs on it and it swings back and forth. Um, and they're designed to help students move while they're sitting in, in a classroom, and research has shown that it improves uh, focus and productivity among kids. So that is a quick sneak peek at um, this year's grant recipients. Um, thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? 
Yeah. No, I, th I think I certainly like to thank the <coughs> teachers. This is one of the one of the best presentations uh, that school board members get. Mm -hmm. um, I look forward to this every year and see some new and exciting things. And I do know it's a lot of hard work for the teachers to put the extra effort in to write and, and try to get the grants. And just uh, like to extend from the board a, a, a heartfelt thank you for your extra work and engaging our students. So Absolutely. Thank you. And I know a lot of our grant recipients are just now receiving some of those resources the past few weeks um, and getting those projects started. Um, but we'll be sharing out photos and videos um, on our social media pages and in our newsletters as um, some of those projects really get underway. Um, but before we go on to the next thing, if we could take a big group photo of um, our grant recipients with the school board, um, I know that they would appreciate it. Um, our Education Foundation, I know a couple members had wanted to come tonight, um, but a couple of conflicts came up at the last second. Um, but I wanted to also thank Caroline Kellum. She is the grants coordinator from the Education Foundation. She did an incredible amount of work uh, putting the program together this year. Um, and uh, as, and she formed a committee of foundation members too, who reviewed all of those applications um, in a blind matter. Um, so yeah, thanks to them. Um, and if <coughs> all the guys, if you could come up for a quick picture with the board. Okay. <laughs> at this time oh. what the spring fundraiser will be is that it's because they weren't here noted? do we know that yet it's yes. funny that you mentioned that in fact i was going to mention that during my report oh, but while okay. we're transitioning <laughs> i'll just mention uh they we are inviting the harlem wizards to come and uh challenge our district 58 staff and faculty in a game i think it's scheduled for february 12th which is a sunday am i right about that i, believe so. I think it's february 12th <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of days in February we're talking about lately. So, But I think it's February 12th. Um, it will be hosted again at Downers Grove South. And um, we're excited for that event. It's a, it's a good community building event, a lot of fun um, for those who come out, for children and families alike, and, and also a fun opportunity for staff members who might like to volunteer to take on the Harlem Wizards. <laughs> Board Maybe members are welcome yeah. also, quite if you'd like. Maybe so. February 10th. That's a Sunday. You something. think it's February 10th? Let me look. I just put it down. Are you sure? February. Oh, you are right. Okay. So February 10th. February 10th. I went to. Uh, February 10th. It might be February 24th, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll still take us all three days. <laughs> Looking at my calendar right now, it looks like it's February 24th. Karat is confirming that. My apologies. <coughs> my calendar somehow zipped over to 2017. Was that so it, correct? For those who That's were correct. there. Yeah, 24th. Okay. yeah, it's February 24th. Thank you. Thank you. But the practice sessions on the 10th for only the board to play. <laughs> <laughs> Against the Wizards. Yeah, of course. We might need some practice. 
Uh, next is our uh, spotlight on our schools with Dr. Kremiscoli about the strategic goal plan goal update. Yes, thank you. It is uh, my pleasure to present to the board uh, the update on the strategic plan. Um, as promised, within the strategic plan, we aim to provide the board with quarterly updates. And those updates are presented first to the district leadership team, which is a representative group of stakeholders who um, help to review our progress, identify any er areas where we might need to strengthen our efforts or realign the work that we are trying to accomplish. And so. Uh, we met with that team and are, are proud to be able to present this evening the report. We also have to present to the board this evening um, the dashboard which has been created online so that members of our community can either review the lengthy report or can click through the dashboard with some updates on each of the strategies identified within the work. So um, for members of our community and for members of the board, you'll remember that we have three big ambitious goals that we're really focused on right now in District 58. The first is uh, front and center for us, focusing on learning really um, gets at the heart of everything that we're doing with um, raising <coughs> student achievement, focusing on curriculum and instruction and professional development for our staff. The second is connecting our community, and there we're really focused on communications internally as well as externally, um, really strengthening all that we're doing so that everyone um, knows and can support and feel well informed about the work that we're accomplishing. And the third is securing the future, and that goal really focuses on um, looking forward to um, what our needs might be in the future. So looking at our facilities and looking at our finances in order to support and sustain the work that we are accomplishing uh, currently and in the future. So um, with that, I've asked each chair to come up and just speak briefly. Um, the board has had a copy of the report um, that was provided also to the district leadership team. Um, and again, that will be available online along with um, the dashboard, which will go live or has gone live, I think, just um, prior to this board meeting. So um, you'll be able to see that as well. So we're not going to go over every strategy, um, but we will give highlights of what's reported um, in the report. So with that, I will introduce, uh, I think Justin Sissel is up next with Focus on Learning. Thank you. The work that's being accomplished in under goal one, under the learning goal, is really being done primarily by the two groups that are already meeting, that's the Curriculum Council and the Professional Learning Council, and then soon to be another group that's uh, just about to form. The Curriculum Council was tasked first with establishing a short term in the next few years and then a longer term uh, curriculum cycle, per se, so a, a, a timeline for curricular review and adoption, potentially, that would ensure that we were doing that on a regular basis and also meeting the needs that we've identified right now. In order to do that, we've, we've spent a lot of time building background both on the state of current curricula and what curriculum change really means in a district, what that entails, and also considering what organizational change uh, factors we would want to be aware of when we're trying to implement change on a pretty regular basis over the next couple of years in an organization that involves this many people. And so after those conversations at our most recent meeting, um, we, we really started to tackle that timeline and came to the conclusion as a group that we didn't have enough information to, to meet that goal yet and to feel comfortable with a recommendation. So we went back to our teachers and our administrators and our teachers association and tried to solicit some feedback on some different scenarios that, that we could present and could become comfortable around making a recommendation that would set the path for, you know, we know ELA has been adopted, we know that science is in the process of piloting materials, but then there are some, there are some needs in math and social studies and other areas. And so uh, that group will meet this coming Wednesday to review all of that and hopefully emerge with a recommendation uh, around the, the most immediate timeline of the next few years. The Professional Learning Council has similarly spent some time reviewing current practice and, and best practice in professional learning for our, for our teachers and we has started to have some conversation around the kinds of experiences we want to ensure happen and continue to happen and, and increase in District 58 with awareness of both the curricular potential implementations that are ongoing as well as continuing, continuously providing opportunities for teachers to be current in best practice and have those explorations. And, and the, the, at the very last meeting, we started to talk about different ways in which we might 
be able to capture the kind of time that seems to be necessary, that, that is necessary, that all these groups are recognizing will be necessary in order to ensure that our students are getting everything that they need because our teachers are receiving the professional learning time and the time to collaborate around that learning and the time to reflect on and actually implement with fidelity all of that learning. And so the Professional Learning Council won't be the group that makes that final recommendation, but it's a, it's a wonderful group to begin working through some of the models that we could then um, look for some other feedback around. Finally, the, the newly forming Instructional Model Review Council, as you'll hear, that they all have a lot of words in the name. Um, as you'll hear in, in, both, in the conversations around goal three, we're, we're working towards some facility planning, but before we get too far down the road of, of what a facility plan could look like, we need a group to, to tackle the instructional, educational, philosophical, why would we do something in terms of a facility or a construction delivery model? There's some, some focus around the 16th middle school question, certainly. The plan calls that out specifically. And so this will be a group that will meet four times in the spring and really take a look at what, what are the instructional and educational and, and educational and philosophical implications of a variety of those models. And so this, that'll be a group comprised of teachers and parents. Um, an early invitation went out to teachers just last week, and there will be an invitation going to parents shortly. And we look forward to that group reporting back at our next um, quarterly update. Thank you, Justin. Jane is going to report on connecting the community, unless, of course, the board has questions that they want to stop in between. Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead then, Jane. Thanks. All right. Um, our goal two really focuses on improvement efforts in communication, our collaboration, and consistency throughout the district. So I've organized the information really to show you the, the focus of the work. We have four different councils working um, at this time to support this goal. The first two that I've named here, the com staff communications and the community advisory council, those groups are really looking at the improvement of our internal communications staff and those external communications. And then the feedback council is a separate group that looks at what are those opportunities that people have to give feedback. What does that process look like? How do they get a response to that feedback? Um, you know, and looking at our systems that we either have in place or not do not yet have in place for improving that feedback loop. So those three councils, their their process over this last few months has been very similar. I'm um, in the progress of their work where they really started looking at what do we have in place now. What are we doing with our internal, external communication and opportunities for feedback? In those conversations is really digging into which, which aspects do we think are effective and successful? And where, what areas aren't as successful? Or do we just have gaps that we really um, can strengthen and improve with our communication, our collaboration and consistency? And so we're at a place in all three of those councils where really that work has been completed. We've looked at outside districts and looked at exemplars of, okay, what are people doing that they have found accept, uh, effective, other districts, and, and then have our initial ideas for improvement. And again, this is just roughly two months of work. Um, we know, and we have some additional meetings. We hope to come back at our March update and be able to have some specific examples of here's some things we put in place, and here's um, the progress and how that, that's going thus far. But it is still a little bit early on. The fourth group, this the Resources Review Council, we have had four meetings thus far, today being our fourth meeting. Um, spent the first two really just building the background knowledge of the, the council, of the working group, on how are staffing decisions made, what's the rationale, how are allocations. I mean, that typically has been handled primarily internally. Um, and so really trying to get the people doing the work up to, up to speed with what have we been doing this far to make those decisions? And then in our past two meetings, started digging into where do we have inequities across the district? Where do we have the perception of inequities? What does it mean to be equitable? That's what we're striving for, is really promoting that equity and more consistency across all of our schools. Um, and then just initially starting to identify those metrics. How will we know we're successful? What would those guidelines be for, let's say, class size, social work support, um, resources, curricular materials, as well as it's not just staff. So we have added three additional meetings. Um, and for our feedback council as well, we will have a January, a February, and a March meeting. 
to really dig in and, and get to that place where we have some recommendations, suggestions, and then can report out at that time. Are there any questions related to goal two? Maybe? Sorry. How do, you, how do you envision it after that? Like, so after the recommendations, and if we take them, then how, do you, how would you envision, I guess, paring this down a little bit as far as the number of groups and fine-tuning uh, it? We <laughs> a actually, lot of involvement right now. I mean, yeah. you can't continue to go on like, you know, like that forever. Right. I mean, I, and I see the, I mean, specific to the resources review, we did just discuss that today because there's definite overlap. Um, so as we make decisions about our recommendations regarding our metrics or what being more equitable, let's say, looking at balancing class sizes or having a narrower range, for example. Some of the work there is going to fall under the learning goal when you're looking at programs of support, special programs, gifted came up. And so really, we'll, uh, resources review, we don't see as continuing as ongoing group, ongoing group. It's more, here's some things we need to put in place. We already have identified specific communications that we want to happen throughout the year to better educate not just that group, but our entire community, um, parents and staff, so people have a much better understanding of the decision making. And once we put those pieces in place, you know that that's what that that work that group's work is wrapped up. The communications groups, I think, initially have some suggestions, but again, and, and feedback as well. Then it would be developing the system for monitoring that, so th which would not necessarily be these working groups. Um, so those could potentially phase out as well. And I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I mean, I think, I think there, we've identified overlap with facilities, um, yeah. with the walkthroughs of our buildings, talking about equitable spaces and, you know, where different, just different opportunities we have at schools. And again, our group has said, well, we want to, we want to raise awareness and promote equity, but the actual work on the buildings is going to fall in more the facilities planning group. And so some of these, I think, will will not necessarily continue on. Does that yeah. answer, Doug? Which yeah, one? thank you. I think for the uh, Staff Communications Council, that um, is meeting a little more frequently now. We had some small group meetings in between those uh, meeting dates as well. And so we hope that that will continue throughout this year. In all likelihood, moving forward, then it would meet maybe once a trimester um, to, again, monitor progress. But, but there's a lot of work to be done in the, in the near future. So uh, that group will probably continue. And the Community Advisory Council has actually been a, a group that was in place um, prior to this year. Um, so too was the Staff Communications Council. But in particular, the Community Advisory Council will likely continue. Um, they have a couple of goals that they'll be focusing on over the next uh, year or two. And, um, and yet moving forward probably will continue to meet at least quarterly depending on the topics of interest for the group and the kinds of um, advisory topics that we as a as a board and as an administrative team are exploring so that's good so uh, I think this one uh, this this goal is is ambiguous I think just by nature it's it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a tough one um, the Thing that will help I think bring more clarity to it is like what are we what are we aiming for right what is the uh, goal that we're trying to move the needle on is it on uh, stakeholder satisfaction is it on uh, engagement in activities and events is it in some other measure that we can say you know what here's where we're struggling and here's where we want to get to but I'm not sure I uh, have a good answer to that either uh, yet uh, I'm wondering if in the discussions you're starting to coalesce around, you know, one, one area that we really do want to focus is, or ultimately through these committees and councils that you will land at a, where we really want to focus and move the needle on is this particular measure, whether it be, you know, name any of the ones that I mentioned or the ones that I didn't mention. Do you have an idea for where the councils are coming to in terms of saying, you know, what, we really want to focus in this area because we want to move the needle on that? Uh, I. I think I do. <laughs> well, don't I, I don't want to speak too sure. far. I mean, I, I feel like it's particularly our January meetings, um, <clears throat> we will have more information. I mean, we've, we've roughed out very specific expectations, let's say for the, um, the feedback council of this is how we envision. There's some expectations of the timeliness of feedback, getting responses to feedback. What are those opportunities? Um, but I, I, I don't. 
want to speak ahead of the work of that group having something ready to share more broadly. And so because it's still coming, when will we hear more about the updates on I guess all the uh, three three goals? Yeah, so the, the goals will be updated quarterly to the board, and so we anticipate um, the next update, I want to say uh, it goes to the, um, to the district leadership team in February and then to the board again in March, mm -hmm. and so at that time you'll get um, some updates. And, and there's a, a couple of different groups, but that feedback council in particular is looking at some of those um, metrics and, and how to evaluate some of the work that we're doing in, in goal two in particular. Um, but there's definitely some more work to do before we're ready to um, bring that forward. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? This is definitely the um, broader goal, um, definitely more difficult to measure and more difficult to move the needle on, for sure, um, because it takes um, a, a coordinated effort and um, a lot of work from a lot of different people. So we appreciate um, all of that time and effort. The, the next goal is on securing our future, and Todd has taken the lead in chairing uh, the Facility Planning Council and also um, leads the Financial Advisory Committee, which are two um, really important groups working on this goal. So <clears throat> under Securing the Future, we have one uh, council. Sorry, Justin and Chase. Uh, 20 member um, council of staff and community members. Uh, we have our fourth meeting next week. Uh, we've met monthly. Uh, we've put together a plan and, and time frame. Uh, that was our initial piece. We have gone through, uh, the council itself went through a, a half day visioning session and we are now currently engaged in two activities. Uh, one is a visioning sessions at uh, each of the buildings, uh, before and after a school. Uh, those were planned for our in-service day uh, that um, <coughs> Snow took care of. So we're stretching it out a bit. Uh, we are scheduling, and we, we're, because of that and some other scheduling issues, we're readjusting our calendar a little bit from our initial uh, creation back in September and having to adjust some things. And that calendar is going to be discussed at next week's meeting and the FPC will be reviewing that and coming back uh, with some adjustments uh, at the January meeting for the board, um, which includes uh, having our community engagement sessions involving the community in, an, in a, a visioning uh, process uh, in January. Um, and then moving on through that, that calendar uh, to develop a master's facilities plan uh, to present to the board uh, into the summer. So we, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we, we do have scheduled a, uh, an architect update uh, as part of this into the January session in the board that was in the original calendar. I think there'll be something coming that we'll be adjusting that um, due to you know, the input we're getting from, from <coughs> staff uh, and some of the adjustments. So, but that will come after next week's meeting when the FPC reviews that calendar and, and makes some recommendations. I should also mention the other activity we were doing is the walkthroughs. I forgot that part. <laughs> you said one of two. Yeah. Yes, I, it's moving on. Uh, the walkthroughs is currently going, um, is that there is a walkthrough with educational alignment of buildings and that is happening with uh, building administration, FPC members, uh, and staff members from the buildings and others, and community members that have, um, that have signed up and so forth to walk through and, and kind of give a sense um, as to the facility's ability to support education uh, and educational alignment. All of that will be put together with the visioning process uh, and come back into a report, and that's that's going on to our next steps uh, through our process. So there's lots going on, even though we only have one committee. <laughs> um, I will emphasize, Todd mentioned it, but just to emphasize for the board, uh, we were expecting a report to be provided to the board in January um, with the adjusted calendar for the visioning sessions, um, as well as uh, the community engagement sessions. We do anticipate um, talking about that with the FPC next week and um, presenting the board with another uh, timeline that just slightly adjusts the timeline. Um, but we'll present that timeline in January and likely we'll have the first report to the board of steps one and two 
to the board in February. So just in, in kind of looking forward, want to make sure that that's on um, the board's radar because we won't have another meeting before January. And I know um, some were eager for, for that presentation. So that likely will be coming in February. Okay, questions regarding the um, goal three area from the board? So from a timeline perspective, mm -hmm. I know that, that when we first saw this plan, we saw this being one of the more aggressive mm -hmm. timeline plans. And mm -hmm. So we're starting to see some of the places where it might be a challenge to fit everything in. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like from the original plan to what we just heard, we're, are we talking about a month, month and a half, two months? What, what's a the approximately? Delay? Yes, approximately. So um, we've kind of run a preliminary draft calendar, uh, Todd and I, which we hope to be able to talk through with the FPC. But in all likelihood, that report of step one and two would be pushed to February, and then from there, the report of steps three and four would be pushed um, to March, possibly April. Um, but we're hoping March and then that step five, which is when we are hoping to have a preliminary draft of the facility master plan, we hope to have that to present to the board by June. And again, our aim there and all along the aim has been that we have that presented to the board and also for the community's review prior to summer break. We know that there are some, some breaks in all of our lives that happen over summer break. And so we want to make sure that at least there's a preliminary draft that is presented um, then, and then we'll come back again in August with a more um, solidified uh, facility master plan to recommend to the board. So um, that timeline of, of getting it before the board as a, a draft preliminary kind of version, some, some early ideas in June, with a, a little more solidified by August, I think is is what we'll be looking at with the Facility Planning Council. Yeah, and I, I think it's, I mean, we've got, even though we're pushed back a little bit, um, looking at the overall, as far as what we're looking at with, you know, and, and what we'll recommend and talk to the FPC about next week, we still believe that there's enough time frame at the end of this, you know, to give ample time for the board and the community to have conversation and, and discussion uh, you know before final decisions are made you know coming into the fall time of, of next year based on the uh, timeline uh, Dr. Kremaskoli that you just laid out it sounds like we're behind for the school year but we catch up and by the time the step six report route rolls around we catch up on that timeline that's right that's exactly our aim mm -hmm. super helpful thank you And so next we have Megan, who has been working with our technology department to create the dashboard. And really this, the idea here is to give our community a, a little bit easier, we hope, glimpse at some of the progress um, and, and make for a landing page where people might be able to glimpse at one or um, another of the strategies and see kind of the, the progress that has been made. So. Um, as you've heard this evening and have seen in the report, much of the updates so far are narrative. Uh, so when you look at the dashboard, that's what you'll see. But overall, we envision this to become something that at quick glance would provide us with an update on the progress that we're making. So I will let uh, Megan talk through and show some examples of, of what she has uh, helped to create. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the dashboard just went live before the meeting, so I haven't created, um, well, I'm hoping to create some kind of um, more attention-catching graphic um, for our homepage, um, but for right now, it's on our Vision 58 uh, homepage under resources, um, the District 58 Strategic Plan Dashboard. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. And that's the top one. So yeah, I'll make it a little bit more prominent um, after the board meeting. Um, but I worked with our software systems engineer to uh, create a strategic plan dashboard that is very user friendly. Um, uh, goal 2.1B of the strategic plan directs us to provide the board with quarterly updates regarding our progress. Um, with the strategic plan, but we want it to take it one step further and provide really um, easy to understand updates for the community as well, um, and succinct and clear as well. And so here is the homepage for um, the dashboard. Um, it shows each of the goals along with um, the associated icon, um, and we have uh, different colors associated with each goal. Um, so very clear, concise, it looks good on mobile devices as well. Um, 
And then if you click on view section for goal one, um, you'll see first the, the goal, the, the objectives associated with the goal, and then a legend that shows um, the different types of statuses that each um, a strategy uh, could have. So um, going down, you have, I'll just kind of go through objective 1.1, just have an idea of what all of the um, strategies in, in the dashboard will look like. Um, so you can see strategy A for uh, objective 1.1 um, has a red circle, which means it has not yet been initiated. Um, and it lays out what the strategy is. And then if you click progress, it provides a quick snapshot of progress for that particular strategy. Um, strategy B below, um, most of our strategies actually have bullet points beneath them. So just to keep the dashboard a little cleaner and a little more succinct, and so if someone wants to pinpoint something really quickly, they can scroll up and down and locate it. Um, we have those bullet points um, behind a view details button for most of our strategies. So people who are interested just can click view all of the information related to that strategy, and then um, they can uh, click the view progress to get a progress report. Um, as the quarters go on and we have more and more progress reports, that progress uh, tab will grow, excuse me, will grow um, as we'll just kind of layer each progress report on top of each other. Um, and as the colors change, um, you'll, you can kind of see from those progress reports the, the change. So something might go from red to green and then to blue. Um, I don't know if you want to take a quick look at goal two, um, but it follows goal two and goal three both follow the exact same layout. So we hope this will be a useful resource for the community. Um, people who want to have you know, a, an idea of what we're doing with our strategic, strategic plan and um, it'll also help us keep accountable to the community. Um, let's everyone know that we have a vision, we have some goals, um, and this is what we're doing to achieve those goals. So we're really happy to get this um, posted and shared, and uh, we, we hope um, people find it useful. And if there's any feedback, of course, we would um, <coughs> love to hear it and uh, make improvements as needed. And Megan, there are more things up there than just the status report, right? Aren't there, if people go out to this website, won't they also find Yeah, it? yeah, so if you go to the uh, Vision 58 homepage, um, it's accessible, yeah, you click back. It's accessible um, directly on our homepage or if you go to dg58.org slash vision58. Um, our strategic plan, um, this is the home site. So in addition to the dashboard, it also includes um, all of the strategic goals, um, the reports. Um, if you click on the working groups and membership, uh, it includes other oh, pages, um, information about every single group that's working um, to, uh, toward the different goals. So some of the working groups is pretty simple. It's just their meeting schedule and their membership, but there's a few other pages that are a little bit more involved, particularly the facility planning page, uh, facility planning council. That includes <coughs> their meeting agendas and their presentations, since that is a very high interest, um, it's, uh, uh, it's a topic of high interest in our community. Um, so we try to put all of the information that they're presenting to their um, their committee on the website so people who want to know what's happening uh, will have that information easily accessible. Thanks. Any other questions? So the, oh, sorry, okay. just to highlight for uh, the board and for the community, James showed it, but um, in case someone didn't catch it, it is this is linked under school board. You go down to uh, Vision 58 strategic plan and if you click there instead of going over to the toggle to the right if you click right there You can see yep. You did it. No, that's okay <laughs> Click there mm -hmm. If you click that it will take you right to this page and again, there's um, a whole lot of information there And as you scroll down you can see um, many of those links and additional information that Megan was speaking about so mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, Kara. Oh, I was just going to say a uh, question on the uh, color coding. I like the idea of the dashboard, first of all. So general, generally just a really good practice in terms of like transparency and accountability. So that feels really, that feels like we're moving in the right direction. Um, am I understanding red as appropriately not yet initiated or delayed and not yet initiated? 
I think in general it's um, appropriately not yet initiated. Uh, if it's delayed, that would probably be the yellow. Okay. Um, just yeah. from a like reader perspective, I would yeah. possibly swap those two. Just it feels like red is like yeah. I don't feel really good about seeing a lot of red on our dashboard. Okay. Uh, whereas yellow makes me question what's going on, but red tells me that I'm I'm, I'm off track. Okay, that's a really good um, that's a good piece of feedback. You can certainly make that swap. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I would just like to close by thanking um, each of the chairs, our administrative team, our teachers, and the many community members who are serving on the councils. There is um, a lot of work being accomplished and a lot of collaborative discussions being had. So we appreciate everyone's time and engagement in those councils. Um, it is certainly helping us to uh, stay focused on, on our end goals. And um, we're, we're proud of what we're accomplishing and, and hope to continue to make really good progress moving forward. So. So thank you. And with that, we would, if there's any other questions or feedback from the board, we'd, we'd love to hear that. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Um, next are communications listed on tonight's agenda are eight communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Okay, if not, we'll move on to the superintendent report with Dr. Kremaskoli. Yes, thank you. Um, there's a couple of things I would just like to report on and a few things that come up later on the agenda. Uh, first of all, our Institute Day um, is the, later on the agenda. We, pro we have a calendar proposal to make an adjustment to the calendar so that we can make up that Institute Day within the school year. Um, that day was uh, full of a lot of professional learning and collaboration for our faculty, and, and we hope to be able to make up that. Uh, we know how important professional development is right now um, for our faculty. So we have made a proposal, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, but part of that day was also the facility visioning uh, meetings, and so I want to just acknowledge and thank our faculty who and staff who are making time to come to school early or to stay late in order to participate in those meetings. Um, the timeliness of that feedback and just really getting some ideas out in front of our faculty <coughs> was important to us. And so we um, built a schedule that would allow everyone to come out either before or after school, and, and we're thankful so many have chosen to do that. So far, um, we have uh, visited with six school communities and have seven more to go, including tomorrow morning. We'll be at Herrick Middle School. Um, we also, as Todd mentioned, have two community engagement uh, sessions planned, uh, hopefully for January. Um, and again, that will just give our community the opportunity to come out and hear a little bit more about some of the ideas we're discussing and provide some early feedback on some of those big ideas. We certainly are not far enough down the road yet to be presenting plans, but, but some of the big ideas that we're talking about. Um, again, at, at the FPC uh, meeting, uh, next week, I think it's December 18th, we'll be exploring the calendar and bringing forward those adjustments. Um, in all likelihood, it will push back that first report to February for the board um, with January providing the opportunity for us to review that calendar with the board. Um, also, for uh, the board and the community, um, knowing that we sh switched to trimesters, our first trimester report cards were distributed on Friday. Um, we do anticipate seeking some feedback from our community and from our faculty as well, um, probably after trimester two, um, looking at the calendar and at um, parent-teacher conferences, um, but we have received some, some positive feedback um, and continue to work on the report cards for the trimester reporting. Um, you'll see later on the agenda, teacher sub rate. Uh, there's a, a change recommended under the personnel uh, consent agenda, and that change really is um, out of recognition that we continue to struggle to attract uh, substitutes. We have a sub shortage really throughout DuPage County, and we're hoping by making an adjustment in their pay rate, we may be able to attract a few more. Um, subs are, are critically important to the work that we do within our schools for our students and, and for our teachers to be able to participate in the many meetings and professional development opportunities that um, they need to be able to participate in. And so without, without substitute teachers, we really struggle to uh, maintain the work that we need to do. So um, we hope the board will carefully consider that recommendation. 
Other than that, just a few announcements. Uh, we recognize the PTA Reflections Art Celebration. We had more than 100 students recognized from across the district on December 6th, and 41 projects uh, will be advanced to the regional level of competition. We, um, kind of in that same vein, have science fair registration open, um, and we ask that parents and students, um, parents register their students uh, by, by December 21st, um, and then the science fair will be held on February 2nd. Uh, we also have parent surveys open right now, along with faculty surveys and student surveys. Uh, those will be open through <coughs> December 21st. Uh, our online version survey will be open. And then there's also the state uh, five essential survey that um, is administered. And so uh, that goes uh, through, um, through the new start of the school year. So um, we look forward to receiving the feedback both from our online survey, which is a district survey, and from the uh, state board's survey, which is the five essential survey. And then finally, I mentioned Harlem Wizards before, but I'll just mention it again since I had the date wrong. <laughs> Sunday, February 24th, 2019. We look forward to uh, raising some funds for the Education Foundation, but also just a really good community event. Um, a lot of fun for students to see their, their teachers out uh, playing basketball and having some fun um, in our community. So thank you for that. Are there any questions from board members? I, I just want to kind of say that the Teacher Institute Day was intended to have a um, facility planning session as part of that day for teachers' feedback. That's correct. And mm -hmm. uh, while we can't make up all the PD that was happening on that day, I really like the fact that we prioritize getting teacher feedback early on in the facility planning process. Even though it's instead of one day, you're now doing over 13 different sessions. <laughs> Uh, I just uh, want to say that that's a really important input to that process, and so I'm just glad to see that that was prioritized as a thing to accelerate, it, which is in a time of year which is already busy. Uh, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you. Next, we will move on to monthly business reports with Todd Drayfall. And the treasurer report. And the treasurer, yes. Good evening. Uh, you have your month to date report. Expenses are coming in within budget, and so those are going well, and they're within uh, the framework of what you know we've spent in the past. In fact, in some cases, doing a little better. Uh, expense uh, revenue is a little bit lagging. Uh, we will, whereas we think we're fine right now and we're good and everything is flowing the way it should be, uh, even though there's a little lag, we are have not yet started to receive reimbursements from the state. Um, those are always obviously a concern and a piece that we are uh, waiting to see when and hope that will start to come, particularly in the transportation area where we have about $1.6 million in reimbursements to come in uh, from the state in special ed transportation reimbursement for this year. We have one piece of concern that we will watch and be mindful of, um, whereas we have fund balance and working cash that we will have to start to borrow into other funds at the beginning of uh, calendar year 2019. Um, we do have a switch in um, the tax cycle process with a new office holder that took um, position in December 1st. And so hopefully, you know, DuPage County has always been a county that's always been on time with its uh, format, we hope that, that will continue. Um, certainly that is very important for us to have um, those funds come in on a, a timely basis. So all that said, we still think we're in good position uh, going into uh, January. Normally in October, as we said, that we usually have the audit. We would have had it in November, uh, in December. Um, the report did come out finally from the state that was in error and taken out uh, that we needed. This is a report about the teacher health insurance fund that came out shortly right after Thanksgiving. Um, as you can guess, our 800 some odd school districts now with all of their independent auditors uh, working to scramble to get all of those done. And we will be having that presentation to you in January. Um, <coughs> We had actually structured the FAC meetings so that the November FAC meeting, with the FAC would see it before, along with the board. Um, 
just so happens we have a January FAC meeting before the board meeting, so we will review that audit with the auditors at the FAC meeting and then uh, the presentation to the board at the January meeting. That is our schedule. Um, other than that, we have, there are two action items I wanted to bring the board aware of, and that is, um, it is not my recommendation, but the Health and Wellness Committee's recommendation to make uh, a couple changes that will take effect March 1st. Uh, to make the audience and the remind the board the health and wellness committee is a committee that was established uh, through contract both with the uh, teachers association and uh, the custodian and maintenance group um, that is a joint committee of um, employees and administrators um, mr. Harris uh, sits as an ex-official representative of the board uh, it has met several times three months three meetings now and uh, at the last meeting, after two months of review, uh, there's been a recommendation uh, for two changes. One is a pharmaceutical management change, uh, which adjusts a contract that has a considerable savings piece. Uh, the savings comes from, and it's become rather insurance, health insurance is always complex and it has become even more so. A big piece of that is uh, pharmaceutical management. A big part of that piece is the negotiated rates of reimbursement for pharmaceutical uh, or prescriptions that a manager pays a pharmaceutical company as well as the rebate piece. Uh, the contract that we are under uh, with uh, Aetna uh, has, is so many years old. Um, this switch has a considerable savings, an estimated uh, savings of a half a million dollars on an annual basis to the plan. And part, in, a, in large part, it is due to those contracts and negotiated rates that the pharmaceutical manager has with those pharmaceutical companies. And so by switching um, the, our insurance package pays a lower rate because the manager has negotiated a lower rate with those pharma pharmaceutical rep, uh, manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some rebate changes. There are some increases in co-pays. Um, all of this, um, there is no exclusion, no drugs that are currently used and issued to uh, staff under the plan are excluded into the new one. Um, there will be an con entire communication piece. We're working with uh, our, our uh, consultant that if the board approves that we will be working on to make sure everyone all the staff that are affected are aware of all of the changes and we have obviously a couple months to work on that but we have already started that piece as soon as the board uh, you know approves the recommendation so this is a, a committee recommendation not mine uh, it also has one additional recommendation and that is to offer up a, a supplement a voluntary supplemental life insurance package um, often it is the cheapest way to buy insurance is through a large group um, or employer. Uh, and so this allows employees to purchase additional life insurance uh, without a physical or without a health survey uh, at first initial offering uh, for themselves and or their spouse. And so uh, it's something that the district, it's a benefit the district doesn't currently offer and it's a recommendation of the committee to, uh, to offer that piece. That too would take effect uh, March 1st so those things have come out uh, as an open enrollment piece and then obviously um, that package any new employee starting uh, as part of their open enrollment would have that opportunity to uh, purchase into that or to buy that insurance as well uh, there's one last item and that is a transfer of funds from working cash to capital and that is the remainder of the bond proceeds that were the bonds that were issued in March of uh, last of 2018 uh, those are the bonds that were issued for the summer work. Um, capital fund is now depleted of most of the you know, money that has been uh, issued, that was transferred early on. And so we need to transfer the remainder of those bond proceeds out of the working cash funds that was kept there um, and now needs to be moved over so we can complete the work and it, it sits there in the capital. So those are the two action items on the agenda. Um, as well as the report. So if there's any questions. Great. Thanks. One, one quick note. It's nice to see that our CD rates are finally <laughs> moving up a little bit after years of receiving very low interest on our 
Yeah, on our uh, cash. Cash management is now becoming important again. Right. So yeah, it's helping a little it, bit. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next, we'll have committee reports. We'll start with the policy committee with Member Harris. Thank you, Doug. Um, this is, as I practice my speech that I've been doing for the past few months, this is um, our ongoing work that we're doing on the policy committee to update our, our board policy manual. Each month, we uh, grab a handful of policies by subject, and we, um, a, a member of the senior administration, um, reviews them and um, compares them side by side with the press to make sure that they are um, up to date and consistent with state expectations, um, but also that um, we are, in, in, in doing so, we are eliminating any redundancies. So we have a new batch that we are um, bringing for first reading tonight, and um, there is um, one we are recommending for deletion because it is everything that was in that policy is now contained elsewhere. Anything to add, Jill? Nope. Okay. So we have two tonight. Um, two first readings. Uh, is there a motion to approve for first reading policies? Policies number 4011, personnel, ethics, political activity, and gift ban. Policy number 4133, personnel, ethics, conduct, and conflict of interest. Policy number 8260, Internal Board Operations, Uniform Grievance Procedure, Policy Number 5139.1, Students, Equal Education Opportunities, and place them on the January Board Agenda for final approval. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried to approve the first reading of policies 4011, 4138, 8260, and 5139.1 and place them on the January board agenda for final approval. Next is the first reading for policy reading policy for deletion number 4010 personnel gift ban. Is there a motion to approve for the first reading for deletion as no longer necessary policy number 4010 personnel gift ban and place it on the January board agenda for final approval? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried to approve, approve. Motion carried to approve the first reading for deletion of policy 4010 and place it on the January board agenda for final approval. Uh, next is a report from the legislative committee with member Siegel. Uh, so the legislative committee met on November 28th. The first thing that we discussed was the results of the IASB 2018 Delegate Assembly. Karan, I can't remember. Have you already shared the results of that with the board? Do you want to take a minute and quickly share that, and then I'll go through the minutes, but since you were actually at the Delegate Assembly? Yeah, happy to. Sure. So uh, as you might recall, uh, there were seven items up for vote at the Delegate Assembly at the IASB convention. Um, the one that was mo that received the most attention was on whether school district boards should have the local authority to decide whether they should allow guns in school uh, carried by uh, um, licensed personnel and especially trained personnel, but that, that would include uh, employees and staff. Um, this was by uh, any measure, I'd say, a uh, controversial conversation but I will say that at the delegate assembly uh, there was actually physically two different aisles uh, and both sides of the aisles were very uh, uh, cordial towards each other very respectful of each other's opinions uh, which I, I will say uh, I was surprised by which is kind of disappointing that I was surprised by that because that's the way it should be um, but it was good to see that that's the way that we, we carried ourselves um, honestly, great uh, discussion on both ends of the spectrum, uh, and a definitely an uh, emotionally charged conversation. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to shortchange that. Ultimately, the delegate assembly voted to vote that down, and so the uh, authorities continues to stay with the state uh, on that measure. And currently, the state law reflects that only uh, armed uh, person, only armed personnel in the school buildings can be police officers. Um, so that was the, the major update. Uh, all other uh, issues, uh, some relating to uh, 
um, energy savings and capital investments there, uh, or some related to um, school safety policies not related to guns in schools uh, was on the ballot, and then also another one related to uh, mental health services. So um, all those went in, in the direction that we expected, uh, but all seven of the votes went in the direction that District 58 voted. Uh, the, the other thing related to that, the conversation we had at the legislative um, committee meeting was a recommendation that, that we make sure that next year when this comes up to more formally take those recommendations from the committee back to the board and get the board approval before we move forward. I, I think in a way that didn't happen this year and making sure that that becomes then systemic so that that happens in the future. And that was something everyone on the committee was supportive of. And so just so you know, that was also a conversation we had. Uh, the other main part of that meeting had to do with the legislative breakfast. The committee feels strongly that we'd like to try and hold that breakfast again and hope that it doesn't snow. Uh, toward that end, one of the recommendations, both because of the weather but also because we've had such incredible turnover amongst our elected representatives, is a recommendation to pursue a later date for that breakfast. Um, right now, the, the first choice date is March 15th. I think Megan was just doing an initial outreach with that to see what sort of response we get. We will certainly know more and, and we'll update the board once we have an, a final date. Uh, because that date is going to occur before the April election, and there was also discussion to make sure that everyone, as has been past practice, that is running for the board seat would also be invited to that breakfast. Um, and so everyone has a chance to hear because obviously the election is so soon after that. Did we check the legislative calendar? That, that's typically why it was in February, because when they go back in session, none of them are available. It's not been posted. Uh, the calendar hadn't been published yet for 2019. Okay. It's so we, we'll, we'll be cognizant of that. Basically, we've each other each year. It's not, each legislature doesn't necessarily set those days. It's usually kind of easy to figure out. We have a backup date as well. The feeling was that if we put it in February, that would be too soon for many of our new elected officials to really come and speak on the topics um, with any authority. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to get some of our, um, especially our, our Congress. We, we haven't had a con congressional representative in a while. Okay. That would be a wonderful thing. Yeah. If, if they've sent representatives, and, and we've had Roscoe and Foster in the past, um, just not in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and now with Caston, uh, it'd be nice to introduce him to the district a little bit more. So anyway, the committee is very excited about that, and we'll be coming back together multiple times between now and when that event is held to work on questions and, and that sort of thing, and we'll keep the board appraised. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, the Financial Advisory Committee did not meet since our last board meeting. Uh, the district leadership team did meet on November 27th, and yep. we'll go back to Elizabeth. And we will. My, my report's going to be brief because you've heard from the district leadership team um, at length tonight. Really, the only thing that Darren and I wanted to add was just an appreciation for the hard work of everybody that's been working on all of the different teams, all of our administrators who are leading those efforts, and, and really just to 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 take a moment to reflect on the progress that has been made. And not just on making the plans, but where so many of these committees have actually been seeing those quick gaps can be filled and taking those steps to just immediately fill those. And really just take a minute to, to, to just to pause and to, to thank all of the people that are working so hard on this. And uh, I think the district leadership team spent a long time reviewing that. And, and, and our takeaway, certainly for Darren and I, was just to step back and say, wow, there, there's a lot of work that's going on and a lot of progress in the right direction. And so just a thank you. OK, thank you. That concludes our reports. Um, next, we have a discussion item regarding Highland enrollment procedures. Dr. Kramaskoli. Thank you. Uh, the board has been provided with a summary of our recommendation for enrollment procedures um, to bring everyone up to speed. Um, last year, the board approved a plan that was a two-year plan to um, ensure that 
we could uh, properly serve the students of Highland and also um, best utilize some available space that we had at Bel Air. Um, so that was a two-year plan and included some um, grade level cohort caps on enrollment at 56, at which time students uh, were administratively transferred to Bel Air uh, with transportation provided. Um, so in tonight's uh, proposal, we maintain those caps, but there's a couple of key features we want to point out. Um, first of all, those students who were transferred in kindergarten to Bel Air, um, there is approximately 11 students who are by residency um, Highland students but are currently attending Bel Air. Um, we at this point, um, we have a cohort of sixth grade students uh, that has three sections in it. Those students are um, matriculating on to middle school and so they're opening up a classroom that could be made available for a, a third section of first grade in the upcoming school year that gives us the opportunity uh, to invite back those students who were transferred uh, to come back to Highland School if they so wish um, so that's the first element of the plan um, we would we would look to host if, if students do want to return to Highland we'd look to host three first grade classes at Highland School using that vacated um, classroom. Obviously, there'd be some reconfiguring within the school of how the, the classrooms are actually assigned, but um, that's the first element. The second element is for kindergarten registration for this upcoming school year. Last year, um, we uh, did a first come, first serve kind of approach to enrollment and um, a timestamp of online registration and found that that was not, um, it, it did, just didn't work out as well as we had hoped. Um, and so this year we'd like to um, offer a lottery instead. And so basically we would proceed with accepting registrations for new um, kindergarten students at Highland. Um, anytime, really anytime starting now, but um, we're really advertising that the registration uh, window for kindergarten at Highland would begin January 7th when we return from winter break and go all the way through February 1st, at which time we will count how many students have registered if there are 56 or fewer students, all of those students will be registered at Highland School for kindergarten. If there's more than 56 students, a lottery would be held for the families new to Highland. And um, that would just, that would be a, a random lottery in much the same way as we held the lottery for um, the Lester students when Lester was uh, over enrolled at kindergarten. Um, and students, would be then selected for enrollment at Highland or enrollment at Bel Air, depending on those numbers. Um, right now, uh, we have some early numbers for registration um, or anticipated registration at Highland. Uh, that number appears to be about 42 at last count. Um, so we do still have some, some room for enrollment in Canada at Highland, and, and we are hoping to get word out in as many ways as possible. Um, to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to enroll at Highland in kindergarten. It is possible that uh, this year's kindergarten class at Highland just happened to be a large cohort in much the same way as the sixth grade class was a large cohort um, and that now moving forward we might have a couple of years of, of two section classes. But um, that, is, that is essentially uh, the plan. Um, we would continue to cap um, for next year. It would be second grade fourth grade and fifth grade for the 2019-20 school year at Highland. Um, currently, we do have a couple of students who have been affected by that cap um, who are enrolled at Bel Air. Um, at this point, um, there are two third grade students um, who would become fourth grade students who would uh, remain at Bel Air at this point. Um, Highland is anticipating um, with, with the um, approval of the board this evening or, or um, kind of a nod of approval, so to speak, uh, this evening. Um, these plans have been communicated out to the Highland community by the principal of Highland School. Um, we hope to get some feedback and finalize these plans this evening. And Bridget Moore, the principal at Highland, is planning on a parent informational meeting on Wednesday, December 12th. So this Wednesday at 5 p.m. at Highland to answer any questions parents might have, offer additional information, and, and really hopefully affirm the plans that have been brought before the board this evening um, because they are currently tentative plans. We're hoping for some feedback and to finalize those so that they can be broadly communicated in anticipation, again, of that window opening for kindergarten registration January 7th through February 1st um, at Highland School. 
Um, there's, there's a few other dates within the plans. I can walk through those and, and talk about those if that's helpful. But our hope really is that the board might discuss these, this proposal, the procedures that as we've laid them out and, and provide us with any feedback or suggestions, direction um, that might be helpful in, in really refining and finalizing these plans. I, I have a, um, a procedural recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I think um, anecdotally we heard about this um, following the um, the online sign up last year. But, um, I think there was maybe a, a misinterpretation of the board's intent for guaranteeing spots for existing families. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to keep families together. So again, anecdotally, we heard of a, um, a matriculating sixth grader whose incoming kindergartner, kindergarten sibling was given a guaranteed spot. And I think that the feedback we got from the community was that doesn't necessarily match what um, I think we're intending to do and I would tend to agree with that so I would um, I for one would say that the uh, the guaranteed spots for anybody at Highland would go first to two incoming kindergartners who will have a sibling at the building so that sibling so that families stay together not a sibling leaving the building So in other words, it's not once you're in, you're always in. Right. right. You have to have. Yeah, I wasn't aware that that happened. I don't know what our intent was. There. I don't think we ever thought of that scenario. No, we didn't. Yeah. We, that was something we didn't foresee. Question on the uh, February 1st thought, uh, that deadline. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine for families moving into the community that that deadline is not necessarily relevant as much as like they move in in April or in May. In the scenario where we don't end up reaching 56 students by February 1st, but we do reach 56 and beyond thereafter, will it be first come, first serve after February 1st? Or what's the procedural case there? Uh, yes, that is correct. If by February 1st we have 56 or fewer students, we will enroll all of those students and notify families on February 4th of that total count. Um, in which case we would not hold the lottery, which is currently scheduled for February 7th. Um, students who enroll after that point will enroll just like the other grades that are capped up to 56, and any additional students who enroll beyond that would be um, offered the opportunity to enroll at Bel Air Elementary School. Mm -hmm. Is there a way in which we can continue to make the uh, message known for families that continue to move into the community so that after February 1st, if you don't hear about it then, you're not waiting until showing up on August 15th and you realize, oh, I haven't registered my kid and now there's no spots. Or I'm uh, just trying to make sure that everybody hears about it in appropriate cadences. Sure. Um, there's a couple of ways that we've thought of, um, certainly um, through this kind of communication, district communication, but that don't, doesn't always go to new families. So communicating with our real estate agents and, and um, providing this information on the Highland School website so that families, as they're researching enrollment procedures, uh, will come upon that information as well. Those are some of the, the best ways that we can think of to communicate. Um, hopefully the the Highland family families and community are well aware of this as well and so uh, we know family to family a lot of that communication helps to support our efforts as well we're open to any other ideas or suggestions anyone might have to help bolster that communication can we circle back to Greg's thought just so we don't leave that sure. <laughs> leave that out uh, we need to we need to probably wrap that up or figure out what we want to do with that so the goal here is just to say uh, priority goes to people that are active families for the following school that year. Was, I think so that was our original intent. the school yes. year, that, um, you'd have an active student in there, then you're guaranteed a spot. It was keeping families together. Right. If, if you have no other sibling in the building in the 1920 school year, I would question whether you should, you should give, be given that treatment. That we, that we, as a board, prioritized this time last year. The intent was not to have the same family in two different grade schools. It's Correct. Yeah. Right. So would we agree with that policy then that if if they, there's no child currently or going to be in the building next year that they if there's more than the cap then they would go to the lottery. Correct. That sounds fair. Right. Yeah. Good. That makes sense. 
I think in, in addition to that, I, and I know Karen, you and I have talked about this, but I'm still not 100% certain where it's spelled out in the procedure, but we've discussed the fact that it, it is your intent, and, and so we should be public about it, that children who were administratively transferred to Bel Air, but are, the parents are opting to bring their kids back to Highland for that first grade year, that they those would be considered current families. That is Island. that is correct, and so we have asked the Bel Air families um, are requested to notify the principal of Bel Air um, of their registration intent, intent by February 1st, and so that provides us with that opportunity of knowing if it, if there is an intent of a current. And I don't I don't know for any families that this might apply, but if it does, um, that if there is a kindergarten student currently enrolled at Bel Air whose intent is to return for first grade to Highland. Um, they will notify us by February 1st, and then any younger siblings would count as um, having that priority registration at Highland as well. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think uh, uh, regarding the, the sixth grader who, who is moving on, I think there was some understanding and effort toward um, keeping that family connected to the school that they already had, if it's the board's direction to um, to not honor that, we will we'll simply put those younger siblings who don't have an older child um, into the lottery as any new family. Um, we we had, that was kind of our dis, um, differentiation. There was a new family enrolling in Highland. I acknowledge there's no perfect way to do this, and we're right. talking mm -hmm. about this 50 million different ways. And I you got guarantee, it. no matter what happens, a new scenario can be thought of. Mm -hmm. um, it, we just need to make it as fair as possible. Okay. Um, we, we've been down this road before at, at Leicester, and I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel too much there. So, you know, that that worked for many, many years, well over a decade going back and forth, right? So, we, so but the, the intent, I think the intent is you, you, we want to give parents the ability to have their children at the same grade school together. And I think this lot of if they choose to separate them, that's all. That's you know, right. that's an option. So don't, we're not taking that away. But if for some circumstance they want their children to go to different schools, one slattery will be more fair than the last year's sort of race. Yeah, to hit, race to hit go. Yeah. On the for, so that's a lesson. That's a good improvement, right? That's a, that was a lesson. Agreed. Any other feedback, or are we okay with I think this is what's a good been idea. laid out? Moving forward, is this going to be the policy that we continue just with the Bel Air Highland, or are we going to come up with a permanent? We're kind of waiting for some of this stuff to come out of the facility, next yes. facility plan, correct? Yeah. So you'll recall this was a, a two-year plan. Right. So it applies to this school year and next, next school year. year. We'll need to circle back around um, administratively, but then also with the board next year at this time um, to again reevaluate what enrollment is looking like, um, what the facility plans are looking like, and what plans we may need to put in place. Um, really at any of our schools right now, the eye has been on Highland uh, simply because enrollment has been a little bit higher there. Uh, but we'll need to keep a, a close eye and continue to reevaluate that. Um, every September we bring forward that enrollment chart mm -hmm. and really evaluate where there's some hot spots and okay. where we may need to problem solve and, and brainstorm ideas. Okay, okay. so the direction then that I, I have is sibling priority um, for kindergarten enrollments. Uh, we'll continue with uh, the second, fourth, next year's second, fourth, and fifth grade cap and on enrollment at Highland School. Um, kindergarten will be capped at 56, but first grade will have three sections, and so there is not a cap in first grade at Highland for next school year. And we'll invite those students who are enrolled at Bel Air, at least offer them the opportunity to return to come to Highland if they wish, and they certainly can stay at Bel Air um, if they would like to have that opportunity as well. Okay. And again, uh, Bridget will be hosting a parent informational meeting December 12th to answer any additional questions parents might have at 5 o'clock at Highland School. And then um, we'll be communicating out on February 4th the total kindergarten enrollment for <coughs> Highland um, and whether or not the lottery will be necessary on February 7th. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is the reception of visitors. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share comments with the board subject to reasonable constraints, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public participation may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. In accordance with board policies 8022 and 1150, individuals appearing before the board are expected to follow these guidelines. One, any person address addressing the board shall identify yourself, state your school attendance area, and shall speak as briefly as possible. Two, the board president has authority to determine procedural matters regarding public participation, not otherwise in board policy, including time limitations when appropriate. And three, the president is responsible for the orderly conduct of the meeting and shall rule on such matters as the time to be allowed for public discussion and the appropriateness of the remarks to the subject under consideration. At this time, we'll look to the basket. There's nothing, so if anyone here would like to speak, uh, please come up. Um, I just wanted to. Um, nice. Sorry, can you just state your sure. name in attendance area? I'm Allison Roselle. My I have a daughter at Hillcrest and a son at O'Neill. I just wanted to touch base on. Um, I thought there would be a little more info on the strategic planning. There was a lot of dates and things that looked like as I looked at the uh, new uh, website. And I'm just curious about the eighth grade option for next year and what's coming up for exploratory. Will there be art for eighth grade next year? Also, um, what grade levels will have weekly art in elementary for next year? And then, um, like I started with, I just wondered more about like the consultant findings. I saw their presentation, which was nice, but I wonder if there's going to be anything written in communication about specific like ideas that they're thinking of changing for things like curriculum. I saw a lot of dates and when things are coming through, how the progress is going, but not actual content about what ideas have been proposed. So. Okay, I think this would probably be good for Mr. Sissel. If you have your information, Mr. Sissel can reach out to you and have okay. a detailed conversation. Okay, I, he said, you know, in our prior communication that um, they were looking at the eighth grade option for art next year and that um, there may be some changes to foreign language and I just wondered what had been solidified, if you are able to answer that. I can, yeah, I mean, it will be a longer conversation, so I can call you and give you the update of where those committees are at this point. The okay. exploratory committee will present to the board mm -hmm. in May, I believe, will be the okay. full public unveiling of that, and I'm happy to talk to you. Okay. Process. And then grade levels for elementary. This year was it first and second. I know my daughter had the weekly art, which she really enjoyed in second grade. I was grateful for that. Um, and I don't know what grade levels are going to get the weekly art next year or if it's going to roll out further. Okay. We can reach out with additional yeah. information okay. as we continue. Yeah, and there and there will be more information public uh, published about like the direction that they're going with curriculum then for the strategic plan. Yeah. So those again, the, that presentation will be made, and it sounds like in May it's scheduled to okay. be made in, in May, May before all of that will uh, be the out. conclusion okay. of this school year. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yeah. Hello, my name is Andrea Staley and I actually spoke to you guys before uh, a few meetings ago about something that you guys discussed tonight with the whole Highland Bel Air thing because I'm one of those families that you were specifically talking about where my daughter's currently at Bel Air but we're in the Highland district mm -hmm. or area. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> after listening tonight, I'm even more concerned than what I was at the beginning of the school year because we haven't even been contacted, my family, in regards to the change of us being able to go back to Highland. Um, I actually found out from other parents, and actually parents that are at Highland. I actually am the one that communicated to other Bel Air families that are supposed to be at Highland that this even came up. So it's very concerning for me that <laughs> It, it, it still hasn't been made right by the administration or the board or whoever. 
on how to communicate these things. And as I'm hearing you guys speak about next year's enrollment and the number of 42 and by February 1st, I'm putting myself back in last year at this time and I'm like they wouldn't have had me counted in that because I had no idea about any of this. So I'm sure there's plenty of families that are in the position I was in mm -hmm. that are unaccounted for. The way in which this district communicates with the community is a fail. I mean there's no other word for it because I don't understand how I'm, I come to stuff, I'm involved in things, and for me to find out within a week before this board meeting that this whole Highland thing is happening, it, and not from like anybody in the administration or in the school or something, something's, there's something wrong here, like there, there, there's something missing. And then to say that um, Highland's going to be having this meeting on, what is it, Wednesday this week, and you guys are like discussing it today, wouldn't it make sense that the parents and are able to have this conversation prior to you guys discussing it? So maybe you guys could have the feedback from the parents as to how to help this procedure, because the way that it's working now is like it's not working. And I don't know. I I don't know for sure what the solution is. It would have been great to have more time to think about it, because as you guys stated, it's a two-year plan initially. So I'm not even thinking we're addressing this again until you know a year from now the change. I don't even know if it's a good change because then that leaves a lot of questions. Okay, so next year, a lot of the 11 people that I've discussed this with don't plan on going back to Highland. So now you have three teachers and you have 56 students and then do you still stay with three teachers or do you then go to two teachers because you only have... So, I mean, there's just so many things that need to be answered for these parents that you want us to make these decisions, but we're not even being communicated the information. And I, I don't understand the train of thought in any of this and I know you guys can't answer me right now but it would be helpful if there was some procedure in which we could get feedback so that there would be some more permanent change so that the communication flows a little bit better because it's frustrating that I mean I did speak on this topic I don't know three four meetings ago and my name is obviously one of just 11 it's actually less than 11 families because there's twins and stuff, so yeah. Those 10, nine, 10 families, like somebody couldn't reach out to those few families directly. Is, is that really asking too much? I mean, I don't know for sure who would have been the person that would be accountable for that, but I, I, don't, I don't think that's too much. I mean, obviously we've been through a lot in the last whole year in dealing with this whole enrollment thing. A couple emails directly to those parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, a phone call I won't even dare ask for, but an email to us to sort of let us know, hey, this is a big change that happened. And I have three kids, two kids coming in behind her. So I mean, this isn't just a one-off decision for me. This is like a long-term decision that we're dealing with and having to make a decision on. And it, I don't know, I just, it's, it's frustrating and I've had a lot of frustration with this school district in regards to things that are easily avoidable. And it, it's like, to, to do the things that are being done that makes people irritated and frustrated and they're just easily avoidable. And as with, I'm sure you guys know, a lot of people have a lot of things going on in their life. So to have to deal with these unnecessary frustrations, it's just, I don't know, it, it just seems like there has to be an easier way. Because for me to find out from other parents as to what's going on with this isolated incident that so few people are involved in, it just doesn't have to be that way. And for me to give my feedback after the fact is pointless. So as much as I would love to go on Wednesday, and probably will, to discuss these things, it's for what point? <laughs> because it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to help change these things for the future. At least it doesn't feel that way. Because no changes have really been made so far to rectify these situations. So I don't understand how long you think people are going to like run on in a circle and keep wasting their energy when they don't feel like it's getting them anywhere. So, there, and I wonder if you guys are aware of those 11 people, because I think that would have been crucial to even considering making the change of hiring another third grade or first grade teacher for next year, maybe asking those 11 students if they intend on coming back prior to making that move. I mean, wouldn't that have been a, bit a smarter step? Because if none of them plan on coming back, why are we hiring another first grade teacher it, it, I mean, I don't know. It, I'm not the administration, so I don't make those calls. But 
I, I would think that would have been a critical part of the puzzle. Maybe I'm wrong, but it, it's just there, there's something lacking here. If it's the communication, if it's the decision making, or what it is, it's just on this side of it, something just seems so out of sync that it's beyond frustrating. And even though <laughs> I give it to you, board members, I wouldn't want to trade places with you at all. I mean, it's a thankless job. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of your time. I get it, but at the same time, you signed up for it. So there is some accountability on your part to make sure that this administration is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the little bit of exposure that I've had to it, it's just like something is missing. And I'm not seeing the steps moving towards rectifying or fixing those things because until it's completely acknowledged what's wrong, I don't see how things are fixable. And when I was first exposed to the district and the issues that are existing, I'm like, I don't care what the problems are, why they happened, let's just move forward, fix it, fix it, fix it. But then when I realized, wait, they're overlooking the fact that there is a problem and that clearly something went wrong somewhere, how do you ever fix it if you don't acknowledge that something went wrong, that there was a problem? And so, and I know that I just rolled the whole Highland thing into <laughs> something bigger, but to me that's what it boils down to as to why I'm frustrated with the Highland thing again when I was over it, because it, it's this recurring issues, things, problem, the same problems keep happening because nobody's looking as to what is causing them, or maybe they are, but it doesn't seem like it, looking as to what the problem is, the root problem is, and fixing it. And as long as not, nobody's acknowledging there was a fail, and this is what the fail was, and this is how we fix it, it's gonna keep happening. And I know that I've discussed it with other parents and other families, that level of um, incompetence and the lack of security and confidence we have in the district really is making people consider going elsewhere, and which I don't wanna have to do, but it's a big headache. But when you don't have that reassurance that the board is making the right decisions with the administration because the, if the administration is not making the right decision, they have to be held accountable. From my understanding so far, that's done by the board in regards to who they hire and who they have working for them and so on. So I guess what I'm wanting to know, definitely considering the elections coming up and then um, I believe the superintendent's contract ends in 2020 and then you have to notify her by the uh, October 1st of 2019. Like, what is the process going forward that the board can communicate to the public to give us some type of reassurance that you guys know and understand that there has been a fail somewhere in the whole procedure, that we've pinpointed what has gone wrong, and this is what we're doing to fix it. Because until the, go the public is given that type of reassurance, I think there's gonna stay friction and irritation and frustration with the community and the administration and the school board. So I say all that to say that one, when will the board, which I know you can't answer, but if the board could somehow communicate to us that they acknowledge those things, that they do see that or don't, because if they don't, then I would Welcome the engagement to tell them and show them what I see and what I've uncovered since being exposed to the school district. I will gladly put on a, you know, a show here next time, whatever it is, because if you guys don't see it, I will let you see it. But I would love to hear from the board the acknowledgement that something has gone wrong here, that has the district in the state that it is, and what their intent is to fix it. And for the Highland situation, it would be great if there's a way that we can give our feedback as the parents, the families that were directly affected, and it actually be used to maybe improve the process. And I'll follow that up with an email to the board members. Thank you. Um, you recognized me, too, as a parent that was affected by this. My situation was a little bit different than Andrea's um, because we did have the opportunity to move up the wait list last spring, so we knew, just like other families, where we would be going, and we wanted to be going to Highland. So my son has been there this whole school year. Um, so, of course, I, I was the one that received communication to know what 
um, the procedure change might be. And I was really happy to see the changes. I do feel that some of the feedback that I specifically provided and a couple of the other families was hurt. Um, the idea that we're not having a race, because it literally was a race of who could type fastest, read fastest, and you had to do it in 37 seconds, and you guys acknowledge that, and you're doing it as a lottery, and I appreciate that, because that's how it should have been. Just like you had learned from other lotteries, and maybe you just felt tainted by those for some reason, but this obviously was worse. So I'm glad to see that it's going back to the lottery system. Um, I do also feel that um, the idea that some might not be moving back is totally justified. I mean, people have settled into different lives, um, and I understand that it would feel like, well, why would you hire a third teacher? But we have to also realize that there are still 28 kids in each of those classes, whereas Bel Air, there's less than 20. And if we just divide that up simply by three, knowing that there are going to be some additions, because I do know some specifics, will be comparable. So I don't think that's something that should be overlooked. Um, but I believe that feedback should definitely be taken into account in any case. That's why I'm part of the Communication Feedback Committee. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, and speaking of communication, uh, one thing that I think you, you asked, well, what are some other options for informing the community before this next round? I think Andrea just really touched on it really well, but just the idea that they don't even know is a problem, okay? So letting them know, but also, um, that communication last year did not really go beyond the Highland community, the current families that had students at Highland as much as it needed to. There was in meetings I had actually with almost each and every one of you, there at least in a couple of those it came up the idea that well we use some social media. As somebody that, that uses it and, and knows that is not reliable in any way to touch every person within a community. It is at the control of algorithms and things that we will only as an individual control by what we've clicked on in the past. Do not rely on social media. Do not rely on other families to tell their neighbors because they got things going on. If they don't, it doesn't affect them directly, you know what, they might not have it on their mind at every moment of the day. But it sure affected us. And what I want you to not forget is that there's some old school methods that would touch every single person within the Highland boundaries. We have mail. <laughs> you know their addresses. And while it won't be every single person that is actually affected by those single choices, it still affects every person that owns a home in those areas, just like it did last year. It affects our home values. And I think that they should know. And I know you don't want to stir up the pot, but people deserve to know, good and bad. Knowing beforehand, as most of you have pointed out, makes a difference. So how can you communicate this out? So yeah, people know, I mean, February 1st, that's, I mean, with holidays in between, that's around the corner. And these people's lives, I mean, I knew people that after we did the amazing Google form, they didn't even know about that. They had lived in the community and didn't know that we were going through that process and they had a first time kindergartner. And they found out when they communicated to you guys and then, oh, I don't have a spot, I'll go to Bel Air. And they didn't make as big a stink as some of us, but it still happened and I hope you all knew about that. I can give you names if you need. Um, the other thing is those that are second, fourth, fifth next year that are moving into our community and Beth Taylor, when she was here, she was very helpful for me. Um, was a nice person to be able to feel like I was being heard. And not just heard and you know, move on, but heard and I'll try to do something for you. Um, that second, fourth, and fifth that's moving in, how are they going to know? Realtors, unless there is something really specific that is making them accountable for it, I mean, it's... I don't feel like it's a responsibility. There isn't a legal responsibility there unless they really do know. Um, remember that last year, part of when I communicated with you is because I know a realtor that lost, that lost a sale because of this. The family decided not to buy in the Highland area because their kids were in the grades that were going to be capped. So um, one thing that Beth pushed for, and she says she talked to you specifically, Carrie, in her individual meeting, was the idea that perhaps 
when people are looking at buying a home, they go to the district map to see the boundaries. And some people, that's enough. Others are going to call the school like that family did, and they're going to find out that, oh, you know, I just wanted a tour, but now I found out my kids can't even go there because they were more informed than some families might be. So if there was some caveat on the map, at least, you mentioned that there is maybe going to be something on the Highland website, which would be great because there hasn't been up until this point, even though this cap has existed for a year and new before, you know, new since the November beforehand. Um, I think that those would be really great things to add for those that are going to be affected. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure I wrote down a few things on the fly. So, yeah. So really, those are my big things. Is I know that Andrea found out at Starbucks when she overheard another family. I heard from a couple of neighbors that happened to knew, know the age of my kid. Um, another family who is one that will have, if I'm pretty sure they're choosing to come back with their first grader, they also have a kindergartner. So that situation does exist. They were one of the other families that spoke at two different meetings last year, if you remember. Um, I know that they found out again from a relative that happened to be in District 58. We shouldn't be finding out from other people like, let's come from the district. I think that mail, honestly, is the only way that you're going to be able to guarantee that. It's a little bit of money. Not that much though. I'm pretty sure you have a reduced rate. Correct? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> a couple of consistent points just I did that I heard from from both of you the administration can't or wouldn't go out and and communicate something before we have an open discussion at a board meeting so that they have the proper direction so that's what this meeting was about tonight for them to come to us say this is our proposal the board members got materials about it prior to the meeting <clears throat> we were able to ask questions so a lot of that a lot of that uh, communication piece can't happen until the board gives the administration direction to do so. But that makes sense. And I'm sorry, I did remember one thing as I sat down and looked at my paper, is the idea came up that uh, Greg reminded that there was you know, somebody that maybe went on to middle school, but their sibling was still given priority. Um, in what's been communicated to the Highlands <coughs> families, from the principal, which she does a great job. I hope you all know that. Um, really positive leadership. I was glad to see all those positive things within the email. Um, just the wording of it, it does say a relative at the school in the current proposed wording. So it would be good to, because when I was, you know, when we found out about our situation, there was through the grapevine, and I don't know because I, I never, I was told that it wasn't true, so I believe that. But there was word from other people just on the playground, literally, that like a cousin, that somebody is going to go there because of a cousin. And the way the wording is now, it's set up that way. So if you want it to be siblings that will be there in the 2019 to 2020 school year, then I think it should be worded that way. So that's yeah. something to keep Thank on you. It will be. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Um, next is the approval of the minutes. Are there any suggested revision to the minutes <coughs> as presented in the packet materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 12th, 2018 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 12, 2018 meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 26, 2018 financial workshop as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 26, 2018 financial workshop as presented. Uh, next is the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately in the consent agenda? Okay, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet materials? 
So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, go ahead. Oh, so in voting on this one, this is where we will either approve or not approve the substitute rate increase? Is that right? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just a point of order for consent agenda items, there is no discussion, so you either pull it or you don't have a discussion on it. Okay. It just, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but just, just to try to keep Robert's rules kind of in, in order here. But the whole purpose of the consent agenda is there is no discussion. In that case, can we you go can back? pull it off the agenda? Yeah, in that case, can we pull off the substitute rate increase? I just want to make sure we do have a discussion on that, or are we not allowed to have a discussion on that? We have to, we have to vote down the motion. At this point, to go you back. vote down the motion, you have to repropose it with that removed. That's when Doug says, Gee, is there any items that you want to remove? That's the point where you remove them, talk about it. it, it it's okay. I mean, we can talk about it that we talked about it, but we've kind of gotten a habit of talking a little bit too much about the consent agenda recently. So, so as a point of okay. so clarification, where, where, where we're at now is we need to call roll. And if, if we vote it down, we can come back at it and have it approved separately. That's fine. Or you can pull it. That's we can fine. go for understood. another That's motion. Okay. okay. All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. Uh, the motion carried the consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet materials. Next are items for recommendations for action. Uh, first is revision of the 2018-19 school calendar. Is there a motion to approve the revision of the 18-19 school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, we just, as we all know, we've got some recent conversations about it, just to be clear that the board and the administration can't just pick any day it wants. It does have to work with our, within our contracts. So, you know, while we've had suggestions to pick a day or have it on a Saturday, that's not always just in our control. So, you know, this is the best compromise we can, I think, that, to get this. Um, it's, you know, we can't just add days to the work calendar. You can't take kids out of school to make up a I'm sorry, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to have to. Interrupt. I just you, wanna, no, uh, we can't. I just we can't get no back and forth, right? Okay. Sorry. I, this isn't a place to get to. This isn't a place to have yeah. conversation with the public. I'm sorry. So I, I just want. Yeah. I. This I. You know when I, I. I agree with this is the best solution, and we're not taking kids out of school. We're adding another day. The number of attendance hours for children stays the same. So I think some people were confused at what we're actually doing here and just the fact that we got some communications over the weekend which will be on the next agenda uh, communications I just want to be clear that you can't just pick any day you want as a board or as an administration um, it does have to work be worked within the parameters of the contract we have a contract there's parameters we have to work within it um, I've always been a proponent of not reducing class time for for any reason and, and this does it. It adds a day of school while it removes a day of school. It's a swap. It's a full school day for, for another full school day. It, I mean, that's correct? Am I reading something wrong here? Because it just seems like the community thinks there's something else going on here. We're adding a school day at the uh, an attendance day at the end of the year and we're replacing it to replace what they're going to miss for attendance on um, the for the institute right. day on the 15th. On the 15th. That is correct. That's correct. Um, I'm, students yeah. are not losing a day of attendance. However, out of um, respect for the parents, absolutely, this is a day that was unexpected to have a non-student attendance day. Um, if if the board approves the calendar as as proposed, it would mean that we are um, putting an institute day on February fifteenth, which otherwise families had anticipated was a student attendance day. Um, that attendance day now gets moved to that emergency day of June sixth. Yeah, that, that was the point I was making. Mm -hmm. That it seems people are misunderstanding that we're taking kids out of class and not making it up. We are making those those days up. Because as you know I'm the 
biggest proponent for a decade saying we should never yeah. take kids out of class. I mean, that's, that's, our, that's our purpose here is to teach kids and teach them in class. So this is, this is a compromise. I mean, there's, there's a number of ways to do it. The, the groups agreed that this is the best way to do it. You know, if you work for me, you'd be coming in on a Saturday, but you don't work for me. So. <laughs> And John, I, I um, am in a family where it's really difficult to find childcare um, on short notice. Um, so this, this it's going to have an effect on, on my family having young children who can't be home by themselves, and they don't have any any um, reliable grandparents or, or neighbors who could um, who could step in and support that. Um, so I, I I see it as as a certainly a a challenge for our families, and I can empathize with that. Um, you know, the small, small uh, thing I'm, I'm grateful for is it's an emergency day that we're at least given ample warning for. The other districts in the in the county that were off on the 28th, uh, they it's found, 26. 26. They found out at 8 o'clock the night before, and parents are scrambling. At least um, uh, families in our community will be able to have um, more advanced time to plan, um, and I. You know, sitting sitting up here for over just the last couple months, um, one thing we've heard from our stakeholders, our, our parents and our teachers, is we need to prioritize significantly the professional learning of our staff, whether it's related to curriculum development or technology implementation. Um, you know, uh, Doug and I, we heard that from the the teachers when we sat with them at. What's that place called? It's not important. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, and and we heard that from them. In addition to the one comment I was going to make uh, for the consent report was subpay. Um, and I'll squeeze that in here now. Um, you know, we, we want to be. Um, we want to. We want. We have to make sure that that is that is valued, and it makes. I mean, our in a lot of ways, our adult learners are like our our student, our children learners. Um, there's going to be attrition over the summer, so it doesn't make any sense to have important learning on the day before everybody takes a 12-week vacation because there's not, you're not going to have that opportunity to, to implement that, and you're going to, to lose that learning, and that's, you know, at, at the end of the day, that's going to impact our kids, and we don't want that. That's, that's all the things that I agree with, that, that this is probably the best solution we can come up with because professional development needs to be timely and effective. So doing professional development of this nature at the end of the school year makes no sense to me. So this gives fair enough warning, and I am sensitive to um, parents. You know, this gives a lot more warning than, than, than you normally get for some kind of emergency day. So I mean, if we were to have a snow day tomorrow, it would be a lot different. So this should be allow some planning. I think this is the best that the yeah. I mean, now it's going to snow five feet. <laughs> uh, but I think this is the best solution. My only comments were I just think there there was some reason in the community or something that that kids are getting losing class time, and that's not the case with this solution. And, and the teachers maintain the professional development, which we all agree. And we got a curious email about a, a, a parent who was saying that there was going to be um, two extra days that, that he or she would be responsible for finding child care, but it, it's only one. You're just you're taking a day out of February and you're adding it's it to one, June. right? Yeah. I mean, the amount of days that you're responsible for finding child care is is the exact same. It's the same because now you don't have child care on June February. 6th. Yeah. <laughs> um, we keep talking about how important professional development is. When I do the math, we still only have around four and a half days of professional development built into our schedule. I and mean, I would almost say, looking at next year's calendar, and I, I know that's one of the things in the, the topic, but we have to find a way to fit more in. And, and certainly not take any time away this year, but really to be looking for ways that we can build in more professional development. In understanding that, that you know, sometimes you have to be a little more creative with that. But I, I, I think you've got a very supportive board for that, and, and that's something we're looking for. Thank you. I think uh, it's uh, snow is not a surprise for us, and so just thinking through how we can give the community some sort of advance warning, but also our teachers some advance warning on what days to protect in the cases where we feel like there might be some. Uh, uh, need to add or remove attendance days for students. Um, I know that we do that for students at the end of the school year, but we don't really build in that time for 
middle of the school year uh, special notice of a potential flex day, um, uh, which in essence, uh, this is definitely a unique scenario, but uh, nonetheless, I think this is an opportunity for us to learn and possibly send a signal for maybe more uh, teaching institute days as Elizabeth mentioned, but or uh, a hold for a institute day should we either decide that we need it for reasons that uh, communities and councils come up with that are a really good way to use that time or for a flex day to uh, reschedule institute days when needed um, but i think that we do that for students at the end of the year it's, i think it'd be interesting because we uh I'm talking with uh craig on how important pd is about his comment about about that in visiting with teachers over the last few weeks um to a teacher the teachers have mentioned to me that uh the pd is extremely valuable to them um, and so kudos to our, our the PD that we do do, um, but uh, I'd like to find some opportunities so that we don't have to sacrifice that or find ways to create waves when we do have to uh, find other flexible days for it. I, I mean, there's always a what if. I, I can't recall ever in my life having a snow day in November. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, honestly, I, I was talking to my wife and family and I, we can't ever recall it. So, I mean, we can, you think you're pretty safe there. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah, I get it. We can try to build in flex days, but I'll tell you right now, if you say keep President's Day open as a flex day, nobody's going to remember that. I mean, we could, and do, we could say it. It's so. true, and, and you, that could easily, I mean. I see on my calendar my kid's not going to school. I'm not, I'm you not might have a snow day, March, snow day in March, and then you can't keep President's Day open for yeah. it. And then, I mean, you don't want to have a, PD doesn't, isn't even in, it's not great in June, but like April and May, it's not good either because you lose all the opportunities to transfer that learning to changing your instruction to impact kids. So like the earlier in the year you can have it, the, the, the better. I have seen where some schools did late starts for snow days, where you knew it was like, well, it's not gonna be a snow out, but if we could just give everybody two more hours to get to work and get to school, mm -hmm. um, that way you're not canceling everything. Mm -hmm. um, and this was kind of one of those where many employers um, mine included just says, hey, you know what? We know it's kind of a mess during rush hour. Everybody just come in at 10. Yeah. We actually, and in, in the teachers can probably affirm this, we actually built out a calendar um, that would have provided for a late start. The latest we could go and still get in the hours that we needed was uh, 9 a.m., I believe. Uh, so we actually communicated that uh, we were going to go with a late start before uh, the decision was made to cancel school altogether. Um, we had built out plans to have staff arrive uh, later in hopes that that would suffice. Um, our neighboring district, District 99, had a late start on that Monday uh, for their yeah, students, yeah. and so they were hoping to pursue that same option. Um, unfortunately, the weather was unpredictable enough that we didn't feel it safe to have our staff traveling to school even by 9 a.m. Um, so we communicated out those options. And then um, as we continued to monitor the weather, we um, had to make the decision to cancel school altogether. It, it happens. I don't think anybody did anything wrong. Well, you know, there's, it's unfortunate. You just have to make decisions. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're, you're not dealing with five people. You're dealing with 400 you know, teachers and 5,000 students. Sometimes you just got to put, put in the flexibility. Yeah, the other thing that we did have to take into account is the uh, trainers and the professional development staff that will be coming in to work with our faculty. Um, we need to reach out to them, make sure that their schedules were available to come and provide the same sort of training on uh, the rescheduled day. And so the, the 15th was a day that, that worked for the, the trainers who were otherwise scheduled to come in on November 26th. Yeah. In short, you know, I didn't want to make it in a long discussion. I, I, I agree that this is the best compromise we can have. There, there are parameters we work within we have more than one stakeholder, and not every stakeholder is always going to be happy. There's times where you can't make everyone happy, so this is the best we can do. Okay. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Member Scanti? Aye. Member Siegel? Aye. Member Joshi? Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried to approve the revision of the 2018-19 school calendar as presented. Next is a recommendation from Health and Wellness Committee to one, change prescription management, uh, the prescription management firm, and two, offer voluntary supplemental life insurance as recommended by the Health and Wellness Committee. <clears throat> is there a motion to approve the recommendation of the Health and Wellness Committee to one, change prescription management firm? and two, offer voluntary supplemental life insurance to employees. 
So moved. Second. Any discussion? I think this is huge. Um, thank you, Todd. Thank you to um, the members of the, uh, from the Health and Wellness Committee that are here. Um, it was um, really important to have everyone's foresight. This is going to be great for our plan and, and keeping it sustainable. Thank you very much. Great. Melissa, please call roll. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. Uh, the motion carried to approve the recommendation of the Health and Wellness Committee to one, change prescription management firm, and two, offer voluntary supplemental life insurance to employees. Uh, next is abatement of working cash funds to capital fund for capital projects as recommended by Todd Drayfall. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the resolution abating the working cash fund in the amount of $643,698 and transfer the amount to the capital projects fund? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, will you please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution abating the working cash fund in the amount of $643,698 and transfer the amount to the capital projects fund. Uh, next is a second reading of policies 4,000 recruitment, 4,001 non discrimination, 4,001.1 har harassment, 4,007 drug and alcohol. Alcohol free workplace, 4008. Employee suspension, 4100. Terms and conditions of employment, 4121. Substitute teachers, 5101.1. Age of entrance to kindergarten, 5101.2. Age of entrance to first grade, 5111. Student promotion, 6130. Program for the gifted, and 6135. Accelerated placement program as recommended by the policy committee. Is there a motion to adapt? Policies number 4,000 recruitment, 4,001 non discrimination, 4,001.1 harassment, 4,007 drug and alcohol free workplace, 4,008 employee suspension, 4,100 terms and conditions of employment, 4,121 substitute teachers, 5,101.1 age of entrance to kindergarten, 5,101.2 age of entrance to first grade, 5,111 student promotion, 6,130 program for the gifted, and 6,135. Accelerated Placement Program. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to adopt policies 4000, 4001, 4001.1, 4007, 4008, 4100, 4121, 5101.1, 5101.2, 5111, 6130, and 6135. Next is a second reading for deletion. Policies 4006, personnel, use of tobacco, and 4141.1, personnel, compensation for substitute teachers as recommended by the policy committee. Is there a motion to approve the deletion of policies 4006, personnel, use of tobacco, and number 4141.1, personnel, compensation for substitute teachers? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the deletion of policies 4006 and 41 41.1. A uh, couple of announcements. Tuesday, December 18th at 7 a.m. is the policy committee meeting at the ASC. Uh, December 18th at 6.30 p.m. is the board self-evaluation workshop at the ASC. Uh, January 11th at 7 a.m. Uh, is the financial advisory committee, and that's at the ASC. Uh, and January 14th at 7 p.m. is a regular board meeting back here at Village Hall. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, uh, collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives, or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students. Litigation when an action against, affecting, or on behalf of the district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the district finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case, in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered into the closed meeting minutes. 
and discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purpose of approval by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 206. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. Uh, the motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess at 9.30 p.m. Okay.